morning. This morning we're going to open in the chapter of Job and chapter 38. I'm going to start, though, reading with the first verse. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins now like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I had laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this name in the holy name of Jesus, and we invite you into this meeting this morning. And we thank you, those, Lord, for all those who are here this morning to worship and praise thy holy name, to learn more of thee and have a better understanding of thy word. Father, we thank you for our pastor, and we appreciate this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, Pastor John. Thank you, Susan. If you would, let's open up to Genesis chapter 1. As you know, we're doing a series on God's plan for man. God had a plan, and we need to know his plan to understand things that are happening in the world, even the world today. The Bible is almost a newspaper that you can read, and the events that's going on has all been recorded in the Word of God. So here in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Go down to the 10th verse, and it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. We talked about last week, about in the beginning, or in the dateless past, that God created the heaven and the earth. And we talked about in the beginning when he created, here it says that he, God called the dry land earth. So if we go back up to verse 1 again, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the dry land. So we find that when God created the heaven and the dry land, that what ended up happening was that something happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in order for the earth to go from dry land to be in a completely flooded state. So here we see, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So let's go over to Isaiah chapter 45 and 18. Isaiah 45. And start with the 18th verse. For... Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now notice, when God created the earth, he created it to be inhabited. He created dry land. It was not in covered in water. We talked about last week the fall of Lucifer. Between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, something happened in order for it to go from dry land to be in a completely flooded state. We learned last week that Lucifer tried to ascend up into heaven, tried to overthrow God, 
and he was cast down to earth as lightning, as in Luke chapter 10, 18. Jesus says, I beheld Satan fall to earth as lightning. So then God takes in um, Lucifer ruled the earth. And because he ruled the earth and there was cities and there was people here or angels that was here under his authority. And there were cities. So he ends up destroying the cities. He floods it. And then he causes the earth to come to this point of being void and without form. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. And let's start reading here with the 23rd verse. Jeremiah is having a vision here of the events that took place in order for the earth to become void and without form, to become into the flooded state. Here Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. So he's seeing the Genesis 1-2, he's seeing the earth without form, he's seeing it in darkness. Now he's going to tell us how that came about. So again he says, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. Again, I'm reemphasizing, this is not talking about Noah's flood, because Noah was a man. And his sons were there, and his wife were there. Here it says, there was no man. He looked on the earth, and there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were gone. So here he's telling about the Lucifer's fall and Lucifer's flood. We referred to, um, in the beginning there, that the gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is referred to as the gap theory. It is referred to the Lucifer's flood. God flooded the earth, destroyed the earth, and then when Adam comes in and Eve comes in, it is a recreation of what had already taken place once before. In the beginning, or in the dateless past, I don't know when the beginning was. Science says it's anywhere from 16.4 to 20 billion years ago. I have no problem with that. Because in the beginning, or we could say in the dateless past, God created. So God created the earth, and it was dry land. Then we found out here that he says, I beheld in the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Why was the Lord so upset? Because Satan tried to go into heaven and overthrow God. He said, I will exalt my throne. I will ascend into heaven. I will be like the most high God. And then again, God cast him down. God then takes and scatters the, the birds and all the inhabitants thereof. Now watch this very closely. He says, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate. The whole land, what is land? The dry land is earth. So he says the whole earth is going to be desolate. And he says, yet I will not make a full end. He's not going to destroy it completely. He's going to flood the earth, Lucifer's flood. He's then going to cause the sun and that to stop shining upon it. And then once the sun stop shining upon the earth and the earth being completely flooded. That's how we got the ice age. When the sun is not shining on the earth and the water is there, the backside of the moon is a minus 275 degrees below zero. What's going to happen to water at 275 degrees below zero? It's going to freeze and it's almost going to freeze instantaneously. Scientists have found deer and found mammoths with vegetation still in their mouth. They said the only way that that could happen if it was almost an instantaneous freeze. And that's what the Bible teaches. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, 
I will not repent, neither will I turn back. So God says, I'm going to destroy the dry land. I am going to flood it. And he says, and I'm going to cause the stars and the sun and the moon to stop shining upon it. I won't make a full end of it. Why? Because God's plan was that he was going to do it again. He was going to bring Adam onto the world. And he was going to bring people created in God's image. Lucifer and the angels had to serve God. They were supposed to serve God. They were created to serve God. But God wanted people that would serve him because they want to, not because they have to. God could make robots and every one of us would be going around and say, praise God, praise God, praise God. But God wanted someone that would worship him because they wanted to. So let's go over to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. And the first verse. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. And maketh it waste. And turneth it upside down. And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. What does the Lord do? He makes the earth empty. Again, we know that he's not talking about Noah. Because Noah and his family was there in the ark. So here he says he makes the earth empty. He scatters the inhabitants thereof. At this point is when Satan became the prince of the power of the air. He was cast out of the earth. And so he was the prince in the power of the air. And then millions of years have gone by. And then God decides he's going to recreate or do again. And let's look at that. Let's go over here to, in fact, let's look at um, Genesis 1.14. Genesis chapter 1, the 14th verse. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide, divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. One of the things that people have tried to teach and say that God, when he created the earth, because Adam, as we're going to learn, lived to be 930 years old. People say, well, time was different then. That's why they lived so long. Because the time was different. Well, no. God created the earth. And it says he divided the day and the night. Now, the earth, according to science, in the equator, is 24,000 miles in circumference. The earth spins on its axis at a thousand miles an hour, which creates 24 hours in a day and night. 12 hours for the day, 12 hours for the night at that vernal equinox, when it's equal day and equal night. So the earth, according to science, has been spinning at a thousand miles an hour for millions of years. So when God created or recreates the earth with Adam and Eve, it's the same day, it's the same 24 hours. Because the earth is spinning again, the, the center of the earth is what? 24,000 miles. If the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, how many hours does it take to rotate once? 24. That's why we have 12 hours for the day, 12 hours for the night. It's amazing that the Bible teaches what science has taught us. But science has gone a little too far on some things. Because they can't explain things. They, they try to come up with Darwin's theory. That we all evolved from apes. Or we all came from this little amoeba out of the sea. And we happen to flop up on the shore. And the next thing you know we develop lungs. And we develop legs. And all this went on. It's amazing to me, it takes more faith to believe in Darwin's theory than it does to believe in God. Because 
everything that I study, everything that I see, you can't crossbreed a dog and a cat. You can't crossbreed a donkey and a horse and get it to reproduce again. What happens? It becomes a mew. And a mew doesn't reproduce. So there is no way with evolution that we can keep crossbreeding this and this and we all come out. That we were monkeys and became humans. You have to have more faith in, in, in believing that than you do in believing God. So he's telling us here and he's showing us that he created the earth. In fact, let's go over to um, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And let's start reading here with the 8th verse. And beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. God is letting us know that when you're dealing with eternity, time is just a moment. The Bible says, what is our life but a vapor? Here one minute and gone the next. Well, if you're comparing it with a thousand years as a day and a day with a thousand years, that ain't no time at all. Our lifespan is like, man, it's gone. And I tell you, the older you get, the more you realize it. How fast time starts to go. I remember when I was 15 years old, I thought 30 was ancient. I thought, man, they're old. <laughs> and then when I got to be 30, all of a sudden I said, you know, that ain't too old. <laughs> That's not too bad. 45 don't sound too bad. All right, then, then we start getting up there. And you start to realize how fast your life has gone by. So with God through eternity, he's trying to say a thousand years as a day and a day is a thousand years. And there are people that tried to teach in the original creation that it was a, talking about a day was a thousand years back then with Adam. Well, no, that meant Adam lived one day. He lived to be 930 years old. As we just learned that the earth is, what, 24,000 miles in circumference? It spins at 1,000 miles an hour. So 24 hours, and God divided the day and the night. All right, let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 1, and let's start reading with the 26th verse. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Notice here again, I want to emphasize again. God said, let us make man in what? Our image. If you notice on the very bottom of the page, I got in St. John chapter 4, it says that God is a spirit. And those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When God created man in His own image, understand, God is a spirit, so He made man. We are a spirit. We have a soul, and we live in a physical body. The real person who you are is your spirit. You were created after God's image. The flesh is simply the house that your spirit and soul dwell in. As I drive down the road and I look at all the different houses, there's different sizes, there's different shapes, there's different colors. And so it is with us as human beings. Different sizes, different shapes, different colors. But we're all of the same self spirit of God. My spirit becomes born again when I receive Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. My mind or the soul has to be renewed day by day so I can understand that I'm a new creation, that I've been created in his image. So all of a sudden, as I study to get in the Word of God, as we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth, we realize that we are a spiritual being. And God took from the spiritual realm and made the physical realm. 
What that tells me is the spiritual realm is more real than this physical realm. He says, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We see things all around us deteriorating on this earth. It's physical. It's wearing out. But the Spirit is eternal. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen are eternal. We don't see our spirit inside of us. But our spirit was created in the image of God. And God created us to be able to worship Him. Not because we have to, but because we want to. As a little boy, I worshipped my dad. I thought my dad, I want to be like my dad. Alright, now... I guess it kind of goes on if you're a basketball player, you say, I want to be like Mike. (laughs) All right. So we realize that we look up to our Heavenly Father. God is a spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The 26th verse again, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them... Notice again, He says, Let who? Them... Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, And subdue it. Notice, God is telling Adam and Eve to do what? Replenish the earth. Do it over. Why? Because it was filled once before. When Lucifer reigned here on the earth. With all the the, um, angels. A demon is a disembodied spirit. The spiritual being you cannot kill. The flesh will die, but my spirit lives forever. The same thing happened when God scattered the inhabitants of the earth. Their flesh, their physical being, they left. That's how you find the pre-anathol man and all these other things. They were angelic beings that during the rebellion, when they died, their spirit went on to be with the um, uh, Satan. The Bible tells us That angels have the ability to come down in human form. After all, how are you going to enjoy the physical earth unless you're physical? Unless you are a human being, being a spiritual being, you're not going to have the joys of being able to, to enjoy the things here on the earth. So God created man in His image, but He gave him a body for the spirit and soul to dwell in. So that he could enjoy the creation that God had created. He gave man dominion over the earth. The word dominion means rule. When God gave the earth to man, and i got to emphasize this because people have trouble with this. When God gave the earth to man, it no longer belonged to God. The earth does not belong to God. It belongs to man. When he gave it to man, he says, you take dominion over it. You rule it. You subdue it. It's yours. Once you realize that the earth was given to man, God no longer had the authority, once Adam and Eve sinned, to say, I'm going to start over. I'm just going to wipe them out. I'm going to start over. He couldn't do it. Not that he doesn't have the power. Not that he doesn't have the ability. It's that once he gave it to man, it no longer belonged to him. And God says uh, with the commandments, thou shalt not steal. God says, I cannot come and take away something that I already gave away. 
Once I gave it to man, it no longer belonged to him. So God said, there's only one way that I'm going to be able to be able to get that earth back. Since it belongs to man, a man was going to have to get it back. That's why Jesus was born into this world. As a human being. How often as we read in the word, it's Jesus would say, the son of man came to do this. The son of man came to do that. Jesus did not do anything in his earthly ministry as the son of God. As the son of God, he was not able to because he'd be breaking the contract. He did it as a man anointed of God by the Holy Spirit, as we know the story, that Jesus went to the River Jordan, saw John the Baptist, got baptized in the water, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then he was led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the Bible says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And the first miracle he did was turn the water into wine at the wedding in Canaan. Everything that Jesus did, he did as a man. In fact, in Mark chapter 5, there was a man that was possessed of demons. He had a legion of demons. Jesus said to the man, spoke to the demons, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. The spirits answered and said, we know who you are. Thou art the son of God. And we command you. It says, we adjure thee by the name of God that you torment us not. He says, you have no power as the son of God to cast us out. You have no authority to do it. You're breaking the contract. The earth doesn't belong to you. You gave it to man. And man gave it to the devil when he sinned. Satan became the God of this world. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, which is the image of Christ, should shine unto them. Satan became the God of this world. And so the demon says, you have no authority to cast us out as the Son of God. We know who you are. But Jesus said what? Shut up and come out. And the demons were cast out. He did not do it as the Son of God. He did it as the Son of Man. A man that was anointed of God by the Holy Spirit. That anointing that was upon him was able to cast out the demons. As God, he was not able to. Yes, he has the power. But he won't break his own contract. Because if he destroys, if he breaks his own contract, he says, I'll have to destroy myself. The wages of sin is what? Death. So God said, if I break my own contract, I got to destroy myself. So people have to understand, once God gave the earth to man, it no longer belongs to God. That's why God just can't come down and intervene and stop all the wars and stop all the abortions and stop all the things that are happening because the earth doesn't belong to Him. You and I don't belong unto Him until we receive Him as our Savior. When we acknowledge Him and say, Lord, I want You to be Lord of my life. Now, God has permission to intervene and come into us and cause us to become born again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. If we don't call, He can't save us. Now He did everything that He could do so that we had the opportunity to be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God sent his son into the world so that you and I would have the opportunity to escape from the control of the devil. But it's our choice. 
We have to ask God. When we ask God, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Notice it didn't say whomsoever God chooses is going to be saved. It says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. We have to ask God. That's why, again, prayer is so important. When we pray, we are giving God permission to intervene in our life. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God is not willing that any should perish, then why are people perishing? It's because they have a free will. And it's their choice. God doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. God wants everybody to be saved because He gave His Son for what? The whole world. But the whole world doesn't choose Him. They reject Him. And if they reject Him, there's nothing He can do about it. Because He gave dominion to man. He gave the earth to man. Alright? So again, you notice what He says. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion. That's rule. They became, man became the God of this world. We were created in His image. After all, the Bible says we're the sons of God, those that receive Him. So He gave the earth to Adam and Eve. And He says they're going to have dominion over all the animals, over all the beasts of the field. But then we're going to learn as we go on in this series that Adam messed up. And they end up eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which caused the fall of mankind. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, God had to send his son into the world so that we could be redeemed from that fall. Let's look here at Genesis chapter 6, the first verse. Genesis chapter 6. The first verse. And it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Notice what it says. When man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto, again, unto them. The word man there is Adam. When Adam which he created was male and female, he says when they began to multiply in the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. How many of you have been taught that Adam and Eve had daughters? We know about Cain and we know about Abel. We know about Seth. But what about the daughters? If all living came from Adam and Eve, it's women had to be born. In fact, what it says here is that when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, what was the first thing that was born? Daughters. The daughters were born first. Now, think about this. If Adam lived to be 930 years old, and Adam was told by God to multiply... And replenish the earth. And if it takes nine months to have a child, how many children do you think Adam and Eve could have had in 930 years? I mean, just think about it. In 930 years, how many kids, excuse my vernacular, they pop out? Most people believe that he had probably had at least 300 daughters and 300 sons. Why doesn't the Bible go into detail about the daughters and about the, the others? Because the Bible is a history book. History, the Bible, is about his 
story about Jesus. And the Bible shows the bloodline from Adam to Joseph and Mary to show that that bloodline was never defiled. All the rest of everything else that went on doesn't matter as far as what happened in order to understand that Jesus had to be born through the bloodline of Adam. Because God gave the earth to Adam, therefore Jesus had to be born of the lineage of Adam. So the Bible shows the bloodline, the generations from Adam until Jesus was born into this world. Showing his lineage. So understanding that, understanding that God is dealing with his story. Dealing with Jesus being born into this world. Showing the bloodline. Alright? What am I at here? Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 5 now. Genesis chapter 5. And let's start reading the first verse. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man... In the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now notice, he created what? Male and female. We know that God created Adam and God put Adam into a sleep and removed the rib from Adam. The Bible says that they removed a part of man. And once he removed that part of man, he made a woman. All right, understand. And we're going to get into this as we go on. What God removed from man was the feminine gender. God has both masculine and feminine names. We got God Almighty. If you look at the bottom of your page, it says El Shaddai. El Shaddai means Almighty God, the Creator, the Giver of life, the Breasted One, the One we receive all the nourishment from. God the Father has both masculine and feminine names. So when He created man, He created both masculine and feminine. We know that through science and through doctors, that the human body, whether you're a female or whether you're a male, both have male and female hormones. But what God did when He removed from Adam, He removed the feminine gender. When a man looks at a woman, he sees the part of him that's missing. He's attracted to her because that's the feminine gender. A woman looks at a man and sees the masculine gender. And when the two come together, as we're going to learn, that they become one flesh. They become one again. That's why intercourse is so powerful. Man and woman coming back together again, becoming what? One. He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. They shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become what? One. In the norm I'm talking about, Satan always wants to pervert. But within the masculine and the feminine gender understanding, when we see here that God created man, He caused him to go into a deep sleep and He says, I'm going to create a female also. He called their name Adam. Sometimes people get all been out of shape, and I've said this many times. Women think that God is a male chauvinist pig. Because all it talks about is the sons of God. But what about the daughters of God? God doesn't make a distinction. He says He made them male and female, created He them, and blessed them, and called their name what? Adam, man. God called the woman man, and called the man man. So when God talks about the sons of God, He's talking about a man and He's talking about a woman. 
because they were created out of one. Adam, or man, in the Hebrew, is ish. Woman, in the Hebrew, is isha. Ish is masculine gender. Isha is feminine gender. Woman is man with the womb. Better say that again. Woman is man with the womb. So when God refers to the sons of God, He's including women just as He is men. When it comes to a husband and wife relationship, it says that God created the woman for the man and not the man for the woman. But the husband is supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. A person that is supposed to respect his wife, his girlfriend, her boyfriend. He says we're supposed to respect and understand that God didn't make one superior over the other. But in everything, there has to be some kind of a rule, some kind of an order. So God set the man as the household, head of the household. The woman does not mind treating her husband as a king as long as he treats her like a queen. Worshiping her. I love you, honey. And then what does she say? What do you want? <laughs> Let us go on. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, the 20th verse. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of what? All living. Adam called her Eve. Why? Because Eve means living. She was the mother of all living. Again, think about it. If Adam and Eve was obedient to God after they were disobedient, which I believe they was, and he told them to multiply and replenish the earth, and he had 930 years to do it, there must have been a lot of multiplying going on. Amen? Amen. So again, it's not unreasonable to think that there was 300 daughters and 300 men. Back in that day, there was no genealogy disorder. So it was brother, Mary, and sister. That's how Cain got his wife. People were being born into this world. As perversion came in, and as people started disobeying God, as the angels, as we're going to get into, came down and had relationships with the daughters of men, and all of a sudden we find that people were being half human and half angelic. We're going to get into that as we go on. That's where Greek mythology comes in. Zeus coming down and having relationships with the women on earth. Created who? Hercules. And as we're going to learn as we go on in this, that it says these people, these angels that came down and had relationships with the women, their children became mighty men of renown. And there was giants in the earth because of it. That's where Goliath came from. They were half human and half angelic. And again, we're going to deal with that more as we go on. Previews of coming attractions. So he says here again, the 20th verse, And God called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Look at Genesis 4, the first verse. Genesis 4, the first verse. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, 
And she conceived and bare Cain. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Think of that for a minute. We read over in Genesis chapter 6. That when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. The first children that was born unto Adam and Eve was daughters. Now, think about the significance here. Eve is saying, watch, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And what did she say? I have gotten a man from the Lord. Finally, after having all those girls, now here's a man. She makes an extra emphasis, letting us know that now a boy child has been born. Because daughters were being born first. So again he says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Let's go to um, Genesis um, for the 25th verse. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain hath slew. We're going to deal with Cain and Abel and um, Cain killing his brother. We're going to deal with that as we go on. But I want you to see here that she says, He appointed me another seed. Notice what the word here is. It talks about Seth substituted or appointed. Abel was the heir. But because he was killed and because a curse was placed upon Cain, God appointed another, substituted another to take his place. That's what Seth meant. His name means substitute or appointed. So God appointed another one to carry out the bloodline. So that Jesus could be born into this world. And here's something that's beautiful. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me an other seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And so Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then men, notice, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's read that again. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. How do you get saved? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When Adam and Eve sinned, God broke coats of skin. The first sacrifice showing that the innocent must die for the guilty. That animal didn't do anything wrong. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So God killed an animal, coated Adam and Eve with the blood. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. But this was going to be an atonement until the Messiah would come. They knew that Jesus was going to come. For it told us in Genesis chapter 3 that the woman's seed was going to bring forth a child. And that child was going to bruise Satan's head. And it was going to be placed under his feet. It would bruise his heel. They knew that Jesus was going to come. Faith is always now. Hebrews chapter 11 says, faith 11, 1. Now faith is. Faith is always now. Faith puts it in the present tense. By faith, they look forward to the cross. They look forward to Jesus coming and dying for their sins. So man began to call upon the name of the Lord. They started receiving salvation. 
In Job, it says, there's no other name under heaven whereby a man may be able to be saved than Jehovah. And he also says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. They started calling on the name of the Lord because they were taught about animal sacrifices. They were taught that they had to take that animal sacrifice in once a year and able to offer it up for to cover their sins. So, their men began to call upon the name of the Lord. As you know, people started turning away from the Lord. People stopped doing what God had instructed them to do which ended up causing the fall of mankind. And of course, bringing in and ushering in Noah's flood. Let's go over here to Genesis, what did I say, 426. And again, yeah, Adam knew his wife. Okay, we said, and man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis chapter 5, um, verse 3, Genesis 5. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he begot Seth were eight hundred years. So we see he was 130 years old when he begot Seth. He was, he lived another 800 years. So if my math is correct, 130 and 800 is 930. Adam lived to be 930 years. But notice here he says, And the days of Adam after he begot Seth were 800 years, and then he begat sons and daughters. Notice what it says. Adam begat what? Sons and daughters daughters. Again, let every word be established by two or three witnesses. When man began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. Cain was born and Eve says, God has finally given me a man child. She got excited because a, a man was being born. When we realize that God had sons and daughters, that the purpose was for replenishing the earth. As we go on in our teaching next week, we're going to find out that Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. And Abel had sheep, had animals. And we're going to find out that Cain was supposed to offer an offering unto the Lord. And Abel offered an offering unto the Lord. And what happened? God accepted Abel's offering because he offered a blood sacrifice. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. He brought his crops. He was given that unto the Lord for an offering. God rejected it. And Cain got mad. And he said... Cain, if you do what's right, if you bring the sacrifice that you're supposed to bring, you'll be accepted. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The corn or the weed or whatever he brought could not atone for the sin. He had to bring a blood sacrifice. And God says, Cain, if you will do what I told you to do, if you will bring the sacrifice, you will be accepted. And everything will be okay. But Cain, like a lot of us, says, I think God 
ought to hearken to what I'm doing. I brought him the best of what I got. He should accept it. What's wrong, God? I worked. I killed the ground. I brought all this stuff in. So he says, Cain, without the shedding of blood, let us stand. God had a plan. God has a plan. And as we see God's original creation, Lucifer reigned on this earth. Lucifer rebelled against God, was cast out. God destroys the earth with a flood. He causes the sun and the moon to stop shining. Then in the account, as we read last week in Genesis chapter 1, it says the God said, let there be light. And there was light. It said that allow the waters to be divided by the land, the dry land. God didn't create the sun in Genesis 3. He allowed the light that had already been created now to shine forth. We learned that it says as we read in the Genesis account... They got, because there was no oceans in the original creation, that God had to create the whales. God had to create them to fill the oceans and the fish and all because there was none. It said God made two great lights, the sun and the moon, to shine on the light to separate the day and the night, the 24 hours. And we said that the word made was, he didn't say create because he had already created him. The word made was brought forth because they already was. He just prevented their light from shining. And today, Satan is still trying to prevent people's light from shining. This little light of mine I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Allow God's light that is in you to shine forth to help usher in the kingdom of God that is getting ready to take place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has gone forth and accomplished what you intended it to do. It will not return void but it will prosper in where you send it. And Father, we thank you that you had a plan. And I can remember listening to the A-team. I just love it when a plan comes together. And Father, we thank you that your plan is coming together and that we see that we're part of that plan. And we're going to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen.